Krásné dopoledne, dámy a pánové. Ráda bych vás přivítala na dnešní debatě s názvem Proč potřebujeme hospodářskou soutěž. Hezké dopoledne přeju i těm, kteří nás sledují online a kteří se stejně jako vy tady v sále budou moci zapojit do naší diskuze. Nás online and who will be able to join our discussion. My name is Teresa Jahutkova. I work at the European Commission DG Competition. Our task there is to protect free um, functioning of the market, protect competition and its violation. Competition for many may be as uh, a very abstract or complex term, but in reality it concerns us all. We are all part of the market and we should all benefit from it. But is it really so? Are the markets here for people or is it uh, the other way around? This main topic is uh, the main um, main topic of uh, the series uh, of the debates named Markets for People. And this series is organized by the European Commission, by DG Competition. And its task is uh, to bring uh, the discussion and debate uh, to member states uh, among people and uh, uh, with respect to what importance uh, there is of competition for uh, normal common people. We decided to leave Brussels and to go and visit uh, people in different member states in order for us to be able to discuss this topic. We went to not to capitals, but we went to the towns like Salamanca or Modena or Salzburg, and today it is Brno. Brno is uh, a place uh, where the Czech Office for the Protection of Competition uh, is based, uh, and there are also um, a number of uh, important uh, uh, judiciary uh, authorities which are related to the competition, and Brno and South Moravia are also well known by, its, uh, by their active uh, support of uh, innovations, uh, science, uh, and uh, research, and Brno and the South Moravian region have been awarded um, the European Economic Region as the first one in the Czech Republic. We invited interesting Czech personalities uh, to Masaryk University, and we would like to discuss with them whether the markets work in favor of the people, why we need fair markets, and why we need to protect uh, competition, and what importance it, it has for the lives of all of us. And I don't think we could have chosen a better place than this <coughs> exceptional place, the, um, the auditorium of Masaryk University in Brno of the Faculty of Law. I would like to thank Masaryk University and the Faculty of Law for providing the, us this uh, space. And they also provided us great support uh, in the organization of this event. Uh, Masaryk University, of course, plays an important role in the business and innovation spirit of this region. It cooperates uh, with uh, the uh, companies in the region. It also cooperates with the Office for the Protection of Competition and it supports um, uh, different uh, innovative activities of the students. Uh, and our today's debate is one of the result of our cooperation. <coughs> now I would like to take the honor to uh, to invite uh, Petr Suchy, who is the uh, vice rector of Masaryk University, who was very much involved in the organization. And I would like uh, him to take the floor. <coughs> Dear colleagues, dear guests, assembling here in Karel English Auditorium and those of you who have decided to join us online, uh, let me uh, give you the warm welcome on behalf of uh, the Rector of Masaryk University, Professor Martin Baresh. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, why we need competition. Uh, this event uh, 
uh, is the fourth one after Moderna, Salzburg, and Salamanca. And this is the result of excellent cooperation between European Commission, the General uh, Directorate for Competition, the Office for the Protection of Competition, Eurodirect, and Masaryk University. I'm very glad that this event is taking place right now at the time when uh, it's very important to uh, remember the importance uh, of competition and discuss its importance. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the discussion in Brno has uh, achieved a record-breaking number of registered participants, which we very much appreciate, and it further underscores the importance of the topic to be discussed. Uh, Masaryk University. Uh, was uh, is going to celebrate it 105 years of its establishment. This is a modern and dynamically developing university with a young spirit and innovative approaches. Another characteristic feature of Masaryk University is the effort to provide excellent education to students in a total of 10 faculties within the university. And it's not only that. Uh, the university is also striving after uh, international experience and development of innovative spirit. A number of uh, Masaryk University graduates uh, develop uh, successfully all kinds of business activities. Uh, and uh, of course, besides Masaryk University, this is also supported by the South Moravian region, the city of Brno, where uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, and startups uh, receive great attention. We are trying not to sit and wait. We want to develop, innovate. And this is also demonstrated in such a way that in the recently published QS sustainability rankings, which assesses the benefits of universities in addressing sustainable challenges, uh, the first uh, number was uh, in the Czech Republic was ranked, uh, Masaryk University was ranked the first in the Czech Republic and 161st uh, globally, a total of 1,403 universities from 95 countries of the world were subject of the ranking. It's a great honor for Masaryk University that we can host the debate today. This is uh, to us an interesting uh, possibility to, to interconnect all three roles of the university, which are education and teaching, research and innovation, and social uh, benefits and services for the community. This is going to be a discussion uh, amongst leading uh, experts, uh, scientists, and teachers who analyze these topics in uh, scientific terms. They can get engaged. Uh, we can also get engagement of the students of Masaryk University and other universities, and the general uh, public from Brno and outside Brno can join in the discussion today. Market economy is the best way of economic coordination that the mankind has brought to practice today. It makes it possible to fulfill the human wishes by motivating both parties in the market to uh, pursue their own interest while increasing the welfare of the society as such. Consumers are trying to buy as cheap as possible. The corporations uh, whose production meets the human wishes with the lowest cost for themselves and for the society as such implement the highest possible profits. As uh, put by the founder of economy, Adam Smith, we don't expect that uh, we will get our, uh, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. He intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. So this was a quote by Adam Smith. Our current market system is also the outcome of the activities of uh, people. And just like we people, it's not always perfect. To make the words of Adam Smith uh, be true, we need to take care of it. The invisible hand can also get injured when the hand uh, hits the wall of monopoly or when it's uh, controlled by the tentacles of cartel agreements. The key su to success is to provide a tool 
uh, that makes the invisible hand get protected against such dangers and to, to ensure the existence of competitive environment. Only such an environment is at the end of the day leading to the fact that the companies will really try to deliver to the customers what the customers want at the lowest possible cost for the entire society, including the costs in the form of natural resources. The policy of uh, competition plays a key role in caring of the proper functioning of the market system because this is the competition which is the required tool ensuring the prevalence of a market competition with all its positive impacts on the society as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank uh, all our guests all those who accepted our invitation to join in our debate today. I would also like to express my thanks to all the colleagues without which the event could not uh, take place, all the partners from the European Commission, from the Office for the Protection of Competition, Eurodirect and Masaryk University, and all the others, technicians, uh, all the others without whom uh, we could not uh, uh, meet here today. Thank you for your great communication and cooperation from the planning organization all the way to the preparation and implementation of the details uh, of the discussion today. Last but, not, last but not least, I would also like to thank to all of you who have decided to come today or those of you who watch us online. I hope we are going to have a grateful and fruitful discussion and I would very much like to welcome you here at Masaryk University and welcome to Brno. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vice Rector. Just some housekeeping information. Uh, the audience here in this room will be able at the end of the debate or maybe during the debate to ask questions, so either in person or using the Slido application. Uh, you have uh, the badge uh, and uh, you have the QR code uh, for, the, for accessing the Slido information. So you don't have to switch off your phones, just please uh, put them on mute. The debate is also being uh, broadcast online and uh, it is uh, simultane it is simultaneously translated into English and who are uh, watching us uh, online you can also uh, use the slido QR code for asking questions. If you like our debate and if you want to share it on social ne social network, you can use hashtag markets for people. And now, please, let me uh, invite to the stage uh, our first guest, uh, Petr Mlsna, who is the president of the Office for the Protection of Competition. My next guest is uh, uh, Martin Kvizda, who is the professor in the economic policy in the, uh, at the Faculty of Economics and Administration of Masaryk University. Then I would like to invite Ms. Micha Mrs. Michala Hergetová, who has been an economic uh, editor and moderator in the Czech, uh, Czech uh, television. She used to uh, work in Czech television, and now she uh, she moderates uh, a lot of um, uh, events uh, uh, concerning competition. And the next guest is Pavel Telička, who is uh, the um, who is the uh, former European <coughs> Commissioner and former member of the European Parliament. And now he is um, uh, involved in business. Thank you for uh, for uh, coming here. And I'd like to say that during the debate and uh, at the end of the debate, you can ask questions, you can prepare them now, and you can now uh, record them into the Slido application in the course of the debate as they come to your mind. Now I would like to ask uh, the question, and the first question is to Professor. 
We have heard from Vice Rector what competition is, but could you please, Professor, start by explaining what competition actually is and what importance uh, it is um, for lives of the people? Do you agree that markets should serve people? Uh, I have to agree with uh, the fact uh, that markets should serve to people. This is uh, uh, starting with the definition of uh, the markets and of the people from the kindergarten when we ha have become the subject of the markets, uh, when we uh, exchanged uh, a little uh, toy uh, for a, a little uh, sweet. Um, our quote is, uh, what, uh, what's the main uh, question of the humanity is uh, from where to when and uh, for what? Uh, people always ask for something, they want something, and in order for to get it, they have to offer something. They offer their abilities, their skills, their work, and uh, they become members of the market. For this, they get uh, some uh, salary, some remuneration, and uh, they, uh, by this gate, that's some value, and for this value, they get some more uh, goods that they want. Uh, in this context, if everything works well, so the kind of market fairness comes, and this is the principle of the market which you are asking about. Uh, uh, in this respect, who is uh, who uh, creates the greater value can also consume more in the market, and the one who produces something or manufactures something, if he or she does it in a good quality way, so uh, creates the value which can be exchanged for something. This is an ideal condition in the economic sense. This ideal then show, uh, uh, ensures that uh, exchanging uh, in the market re, uh, ensures efficiency with the minimum of the costs uh, by producing the goods which are most valuable. And in the economic sense, competition causes uh, the fairness of the markets. Whoever is more skillful and hardworking uh, will get more, and who gets um, less, who get uh, who produces uh, better quality uh, goods uh, for less costs, uh, is remunerated in a, a better way. And uh, in this respect, uh, it is ideal. Unfortunately, the reality is quite far distant from, the, uh, from this uh, theory and from this ideal uh, ideal status. Uh, uh, we, um, in uh, the uh, we teach uh, students what the market is uh, in the four uh, weeks at the beginning of their studies and uh, the following four years we teach them why the market does not work, uh, why the competition is not perfect and how it is possible. If I simplify this, uh, this um, market, uh, uh, market um, uh, disorders have uh, two main, uh, main causes. Uh, it was uh, already said by the quote by Adam Smith, uh, the entities do not get to the market uh, to provide charity. They get to the market to earn, to get something, To they try to minimize the costs uh, they have to sacrifice. This is quite legitimate. This is OK. But uh, the, the Smith's uh, quote uh, can be, uh, can be uh, complemented by another quote, which is quite uh, close closely linked to it. If people of the same discipline meet during a discussion, it is not, um, it is, uh, uh, this discussion always uh, uh, ends uh, in their conspiracy against the public and increasing the prices. This is what always happens. And that's why the fixed rules of the functioning of the market uh, has to be, have to be set. Uh, and uh, this is uh, why we are here. And the second factor which deforms or disables the competition in the market is the specifics uh, of different uh, disciplines. There are such uh, disciplines such as telecommunications or traffic uh, transport. Uh, 
where the uh, the competition is not very possible uh, and there has to be a regulator who supervises it and this is uh, a, a task for an antitrust uh, trust uh, authority such as the Office uh, for the Protection of Competition. Thank you. I think you've defined it very precisely, but very uh, simply, um, so everybody can understand it. And now we can go uh, to the practical things. So, <laughs> Mr. President, the role of your office is to protect competition. Uh, can you please tell us uh, what your team is doing specifically to make uh, markets works for people in a fair manner? And can you also give us some specific examples where your office uh, intervention, intervention had uh, a concrete, let's say, tangible benefits for men in the street? Well, thank you for the question. Perhaps I will follow up on the previous speakers, how we understand competition or the, the importance of competition in the function of the state. We speak about the free market, protection of competition, fair markets, uh, equal opportunities. But we also need to realize that the idea of free market and the development of competition and its protection uh, on a global scale, on the European scale, is primarily related to the the development after World War II. The free market, the social economy was uh, put in the center of the democratic legal system that came to existence after World War II, establishing defense mechanism to uh, any kind of dictatorship. If you have dictatorship, you have to control several things to control the society. First, you need to abandon vertical division of power, meaning uh, uh, restrict the local governance and uh, control the market to set the priorities, control the markets, and um, uh, sue them to uh, their needs. So if you look at the society as we have it today, to me, the competition and free market is one of the key aspects of the democratic uh, legal state. Uh, of course, whether the market is perfect or not perfect, it's still important that it doesn't only depend on a political will that can control the market through its own decision, which is a highly important principle. Of course, uh, what happens is you have all kinds of distortions, uh, violations, uh, when some other welfare is uh, monitored rather than the institute of the, of the market itself. But of course, this is then a political de decision. But what should always be a signal just be alert is any attempt to control the market uh, in a political way. That's why, and uh, this brings me to uh, the Office for the Protection of Competition and all uh, uh, anti-monopoly offices in, the, in Europe, they are all independent of the government, of the political power, of the parliaments, and the only one who has a right to uh, control it are the courts. And I believe that this is the right principle to follow. Uh, back to your question. Of course, uh, the uh, office uh, always uh, acts uh, within the power it has. So uh, the agenda is where we are trying to reveal cartel agreements, vertical or horizontal agreements. Of course, uh, we have the power to uh, to punish, the, um, uh, to uh, look at ex ante uh, mergers, so to prevent ex ante from uh, uh, merging uh, dominant players in the market or even monopoly uh, players. And of course, we also have a number of uh, uh, activities. Of course, what matters is the outcome, who we protect. We do not protect the competitors, the undertakings, to have higher profits, uh, good conditions, market conditions. We protect the consumers. So the uh, consumers in the center of our decision-making practice. And of course, we can only use those tools that we have available. And we are something between an administrative body and a police uh, enforcement body. So if we are supposed to punish someone, we need to have evidence. And as I've said, over us, it's only the courts. And we have to justify our decisions uh, uh, with respect to uh, court review, although we believe that something unfair can be happening in the market, you always need to get evidence, otherwise you cannot punish anyone. So as regards the practical examples uh, to highlight, of course, there is a number of them. 
but uh, a, a case from a recent past. Uh, the office uh, approved a horizontal cartel agreement. Uh, show me uh, telephone providers and other um, uh, devices. Of course, uh, uh, we rectified the behavior. They stopped uh, co uh, coordinating their activities. We punished uh, uh, meal voucher companies who limited the possibility of applying the vouchers in uh, retail shops. Uh, this is something that uh, people in the Czech Republic will remember because it was limited to five vouchers per purchase. There was no reason why uh, the meal uh, voucher providers should provide it. It only provided cash flow for the companies throughout the calendar year without any fluctuations of uh, rise and fall. So we also punished uh, RPM agreements. Uh, these are uh, price fixing agreements for the final uh, end sale of end products, uh, uh, like Tescoma company, where they fix the prices for the final sale. And if a retailer did not follow these prices, then uh, the company stopped uh, uh, supplying the goods. And all these practices uh, result in the fact that at the end of the day, the consumer pays uh, higher prices. So this is a practice, of course, set of practices that make it possible to keep, uh, as the professor say, to keep the profit, to keep the profits uh, eliminate the fear of uh, insecurity that I would not have to succeed in the market, I could go bankrupt, I could not uh, generate such high profits. And of course, if I've mentioned the competence to uh, punish the abuse of dominant position and uh, ex ante uh, mergers. Uh, uh, examination. Recently, the office has issued several uh, fundamental decisions. All of them were published on our website, so I don't want to, uh, I am not revealing any secrets, but we did not allow a merger between Czech uh, Post and PNS company for fear of endangering, uh, well, let's say, uh, of fear of having a monopoly in the area of distributions. So this was not permitted by our office and uh, what we permitted, but the behavioral commitments a merger uh, between Cetin, which uh, purchased uh, a provider of uh, optical network, uh, Nate says that. But with uh, some commitments, because as regards the network markets, of course, this is quite complicated because you cannot order them to sell some something and someone else will buy it when you have like three, four players in the market and one of them is not allowed. Then, of course, the next one who can apply are the remaining ones. So you are basically running in circles. And then uh, the Office for the Protection of Competition as well as uh, the network regulators uh, need to uh, follow some behavioral commitments, meaning allowing access to the infrastructure networks uh, or define uh, pricing uh, commitments uh, and uh, allow other competitors in the market to uh, uh, use the infrastructure, use the service under fair conditions, or what uh, we did in case of the setting um, merge we also defined a commitment to invest uh, quite a large amount into the better infrastructure. Because if the objective of the network industries is to make sure that we have high-speed internet everywhere and optical networks everywhere, then of course that depends on the competitors, whether they are willing to make investments or whether they are going to downturn the investments to keep their um, uh, dominant position in the market. So sometimes we behave like a competition body, but sometimes through these tools we can also behave uh, like like uh, a regulator. And then, of course, we also have the power to uh, punish or assess behavior of uh, public authorities. These are mainly cities and municipalities. Whether the behavior of cities and municipalities does not distort the rules of competition. And I would like to mention a great example when the capital of Prague uh, was penalized uh, for uh, a decree. Uh, and this decree was quite seemingly innocent. And it defined a rule for some hybrid vehicles in the capital of Prague were given an exemption 
uh, to uh, pay fees for parking. And when we had a look at uh, uh, the volumes, uh, what what is available in the um, uh, in the market? Mm -hmm. It was just one producer of these vehicles who was exempted from the payment, and if you had the EV, you would have to pay anyway. So, even the uh, public authority can in uh, somehow deform the market and uh, provide a selective advantage for uh, one of the competitors. And then, of course, uh, what is uh, not negligible is the cycle logical pressure that the office can develop uh, in the market because uh, either you are intensely interested in the market I'm quite sure there will be some question about food stuff and the prices of foods uh, foodstuffs uh, where the office uh, made some um, utilities uh, examination we monitored a period of uh, crisis boom COVID period energy prices the four in Ukraine all the way to the current period and we came to certain conclusions, whether the markets are uh, oligopolical or whether someone is the poor guy who, uh, within the vertical agreements from the production to the retail, uh, whether there is someone losing the profit. And then it turns out that it's not the case, that uh, very often the markets, especially the uh, highly uh, concentrated markets, can transfer the increased costs uh, to the prices reflected and at the end of the day uh, ref um, increase the prices for the consumers. But as the consumers in the center of um, protection, uh, the consumer is also the, the defining factor. The consumer is the one defining who is going to survive, who is going to go bankrupt, whose uh, services and goods they are going to buy or not going to buy. So at the end of the day, when uh, sometimes we are complaining because we think that the market doesn't work or doesn't work in an efficient way, then you have to uh, ask yourself, and uh, do we accept what the seller offers, what the specific competitor offers? And maybe recently it uh, has shown that the Czech consumer has the power. The Czech consumer can react to what he likes and what he doesn't like. And then when we monitor the markets, we see how the market shares are changing, uh, which is only defined by the behavior of the competitor, of course, unlike there is a merger. But as regards foodstuffs, which is a current topic, uh, there is no merger happening. And still, the market shares of the retail chains are changing compared to the period 10 years ago which is, again, uh, an out outcome of the behavior of the consumers. So this is uh, probably all from me. So you are confirming here that us citizens and consumers are part of the market uh, of competition market, and we are uh, forming uh, the competition. Yes, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Now I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Hergetova. In your practice as a reporter and moderator, you are involved in communication and uh, bring mainly economic topics to the people. We have now heard from experts what competition is, why we need it, and uh, what the Office for the Protection of Competition does to protect it. But I would like to ask you, in your opinion, how do people perceive competition and a fair market? Do you think this is a, a topic for them or not? Does it resonate among people? Do you think that people know what it means for their lives? And if not, uh, why not? And uh, what we could do better in order to have it? I thank you for the floor. Um, I think the gentlemen have said very well, defined very well what the competition is and what we do to protect it. Um, but this is not uh, so well seen in the social network. If we, for example, look at uh, the uh, mergers of uh, Česká Pošta and uh, uh, the first um, uh, journalist uh, company, we don't know what impact uh, it would have if they merged. Uh, if uh, we, um, we, it would be. Um, 
Uh, we know that somebody has intervened in time, and that's why we, we don't have to pay so much money for the letters. And uh, for example, Brussels is banning the cars with combustion engines. Uh, it uh, orders us not to burn coal, and that's why increasing the prices of the energy. So it is always the narrative of evil Brussels, which always dictates something to us and uh, prohibits something. But it is not about Brussels. It is about how we deal with it and how our politicians uh, deal with it. Uh, uh, we know that uh, if uh, we don't like something, we always try to find uh, somebody who is guilty for it around us. We don't find the fault in ourselves, but uh, they are. we are trying to find the fault in Brussels. Brussels is not uh, a, a person that we could uh, punish, uh, but we can blame it uh, for uh, many things. Uh, uh, the, if we look at the opinion polls, so this, we know that the trust in uh, the European Union is uh, the lowest since 2016. It has declined by 46 percent. At the moment, uh, the, uh, what uh, I don't know if you can guess how much uh, the European Commission, wh how much trust it has. Do you think it has over 60 percent? Do you think over 50? Who thinks over 50? Do you think over 40 percent? Uh, um, over 30 percent. Uh, over 20 percent. Uh, so it's almost all of you. And so it has 38 uh, percent. So this is most what European Commission, uh, what trust it has. Uh, and this is what we have a tendency to put the blame on. Uh, we all, you are all here young and, um, and uh, well educated people. If we look uh, at uh, our uh, handbag, uh, um, so you have a uh, uh, ID card uh, which uh, you use for traveling uh, in 27 uh, countries uh, of the world, uh, of Europe. Uh, then you have a passport in your handbag which, uh, uh, by which you can travel to 121 countries of the world. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, unif un Uniform Europe. Uh, uh, and uh, you, as students, can also travel to many universities uh, with, uh, within Europe. Europe uh, in your uh, within the Erasmus projects uh, if you have uh, a health um, a health card uh, if you have a flu or if you break your leg so you can use just this single card uh, of your health insurance which you can use in many countries of Europe and of the world we have uh, got used to the positive things uh, as they were a commonplace and we can't imagine that it would be different, but we just don't like uh, that evil Brussels is uh, banning something or uh, ordering something. Um, and we, it is kind of, kind of the gold plating that uh, the, we sometimes make uh, strict rules, even strict uh, in our, com com for example, in our country, some donuts were packed uh, in, uh, in uh, plastic bags. Uh, uh, you are young, but uh, like in 2002, uh, there was uh, some information information uh, information available that uh, the that uh, the the pastry uh, had to be uh, put uh, in the uh, in the uh, plastic bags and nobody stopped uh, uh, everybody stopped buying them because uh, they were uh, they were um, uh, they were um, not uh, not very nice after this, uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, after the Ministry of uh, Health uh, did uh, ordered this uh, without uh, any uh, without any basis, and uh, the European Commission then said, "No, it is not so." The same applied to the touchless um, uh, water taps uh, or. For example, this, this, uh, uh, the, these uh, paper towels uh, for one uh, for single use. Uh, it was uh, what the European Com uh, Union uh, wanted to introduce, uh, but uh, it was um, not. Uh, it did not apply to to uh, everybody in such a way. How we made it. Uh, stricter. Uh, some manufacturers um, uh, aren't on this uh, because things were um, uh, 
It was, um, and for example, biofuels was what we implemented uh, half a year before the Europe, uh, European Union uh, required it. Uh, and uh, now it is about the energy uh, demand, uh, energy uh, requirements uh, of the buildings. Uh, the Czech Republic even made it stricter than uh, than. It is uh, implemented uh, within Europe, and uh, and it is not uh, uh, the fault uh, of Brussels. This is us whose fault it is, uh, and how we could improve it. Uh, if I knew how to improve it, I would be doing something completely different. Uh, uh, but this is uh, w how we perceive the European Union. We uh, we have got used to the fact uh, that if there is good news, we don't consider it a news. Uh, the media offer uh, the bad news, what we did not succeed in, uh, succeeded in, and the politicians, for them, it is most, um, uh, it is the the simplest. simplest. Uh, so uh, those responsible uh, who um, occupy the media space, they should uh, uh, not, uh, they should stop uh, trying to uh, find uh, the the somebody to blame and uh, uh, there are some things which do not only concern uh, the single market, but uh, some uh, some disinformation or some lies. Uh, uh, we have stopped uh, stopped uh, using the word lies. Uh, uh, but uh, they appear in the media space on social networks uh, and uh, they put them uh, we should put them into the context we should uh, define where this information is correct uh, and uh, how like uh, the connection of two pieces of information which are which are correct uh, by merging them alike can be uh, created uh, so this is very nicely seen and uh, this is the view to, of the single market. Uh, you have defined it very nicely. We are used to uh, the fact uh, that Brussels is considered as a, 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 a person guilty for everybody and everything. But we have to also look at the positive information, positive results that should be actively and well communicated. Mr. Talichka, you are the last one here, although you uh, were at the very start. Uh, the Czech Republic is going to celebrate uh, 20 years since accession to the EU next year, and you were there. You were the main negotiator. So the competition rules were, of course, uh, one of the topics uh, discussed uh, uh, during the accession talks. Uh, so how difficult was it for us to accept these competition rules and how these uh, did this negotiation take place? Well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, of course, I can uh, only start by saying that I'm quite enthusiastic about this auditorium because I studied law in Prague and uh, the seats were made of wood. It was cold there. Uh, of course, uh, it was easier to leave it because everyone can see you when you are leaving, but uh, still my head off, maybe I should have been studying here. Uh, back to your question. Uh, well, uh, let's um, uh, recall what these accession talks were about and at what time in what system and ecosystem we were at that time. So to simplify that, the accession talks were uh, about the following pillars. First, in the individual areas, including the competition. But I would say that the competition uh, somehow overlaps. Like during the talk today, uh, competition uh, runs through all the other chapters, being industrial policy, telecommunication, and others. And uh, the main thing was to prove that uh, we are able uh, to adopt the uh, legal rules of the EU and we can transpose them to our system of law in the form in which it corresponded uh, to the spirit of the individual legal standard and that we are also able to implement them. And if needed, if we, for example, talk about the competition, uh, that the national authority, in our case, the Office for the Protection of Competition can enforce its performance. And as this area 
uh, was relatively new. We are talking about the second uh, part of the 1990s because these negotiations started in 98, uh, but the preparation was ongoing for some time. It took some while to prepare our negotiation positions. So you often hear that uh, uh, in the media, wild 90s. 90, wild years of 1990s. Of course, this was not about the uh, criminal stories from the 1990s, but of course, uh, the market economy at that time was only being developed. The system of law was just being transposed. Uh, uh, the policies were changing. And of course, it was done by people with a certain level of knowledge with some uh, political interests. So. Uh, to grasp it in the right way, and as we've heard, uh, without gold plating, meaning that you shouldn't get more and more uh, ideas in the form of, um, uh, of amendments in the House of Parliaments. Of course, this was not easy, and we had to demonstrate during these talks that this is all in line. Of course, the EU has examined that, but this was the first step, and at the same time, we had to prove that we were able to bring it to practice and, if needed, enforce the implementation. Maybe uh, the President will correct me, because it's been quite a while ago, but I believe that the office, uh, I think you've had the name uh, since 1996, so it was like quite a brand new authority. Uh, which was not ready and fitted enough for this function. So we need to prove that gradually, and as of the accession date, uh, the uh, Office for the Protection of uh, Competition will manage to perform its tasks, meaning that the internal market and the member states and the uh, uh, European Commission can rely. So this was, let's say, one of the pillars during the negotiations. And then, of course, uh, generally speaking, uh, we uh, discussed the transitory period, which is the period after the accession to the EU, during which you don't have to uh, implement the specific uh, uh, regulation as required by the uh, policy and legal regulation. The reason is that, let's say, the financial, economic, social impacts, or let's say the institutional or political impacts are so crucial that the country has cannot cope yet. But it's not that uh, serious that you could not ac uh, access. So this is what the transition period is about. As regards competition, this was one of the topics where the transitory period was not possible. Because you distort the competition, you, as we've heard, you, uh, let's say, you gain some uh, market advantage. And then, of course, this is reflected in the position of the competition and uh, in the behavior and, of course, uh, behavior of the consumers. But in some other areas, this was happening. For example, uh, sanitary standards sometimes uh, uh, for slaughterhouses. Uh, it was so complicated that uh, uh, they, of course, tried to get some temporary uh, exemption. But when they s told them, you, then you cannot uh, bring your products to the market, then, of course, they, uh, they enforced that. So we also had to um, uh, convince the local market that the transitory period would be more Im difficult than uh, bridging this period. But still, there were some uh, industries uh, talking about the climate at that time. Well, I had a double role. I was the chief uh, negotiator as a state uh, secretary. I was uh, cooperating the preparation and I went to the government and um, So we had to discuss at the government level whether it makes sense, uh, whether we can cope, and this is really something we want to discuss. So this was very uh, difficult, and it was very difficult in the area of competition because the Czech industry at that time was dominated by heavy industry at that time. So we talk about steelworks, uh, defense industry, and one of the exemptions, although I've said it was um, not really about the transitory period in terms of competition, one of the exemptions was related to steel and textile industry. So uh, I know there is a protocol about the restructuralization of the steel industry. And this is where you can see the logics. Mm. 
of making it possible to have a, a temporary public support, uh, but you have to achieve something. And this is about restructurization of the industry or the company. So this was the subject of the discussions. Of course, this was uh, quite uh, important because it was 14 billion check rounds of public support. But uh, of course, the industries would have to change accordingly. Uh, the industries would have to be more efficient, more productive, uh, more market oriented, because at that time, of course, we could be discussing whether uh, these were really uh, businesses, industries that are part of the uh, um, market economy. Uh, their market uh, strategy had to be assessed. So the lobbying, especially uh, in regions where uh, these important, uh, uh, you have like a, a uh, steelworks uh, foundries that they were employing tens of thousands of people and they have very strong lobbying behind so uh, of course this was quite complicated and of course uh, these uh, lobbies they, they had uh, representatives in the government and we needed to discuss with them in order to get uh, to a point that would be uh, that would be acceptable so that we could uh, um, um, discuss the accession to the EU so this is just a flavor of course the structure was much more complicated but I just want to say that there were two levels the Brussels the Union level and the Czech level, and uh, it was partially about convincing us that we can do it and about the transition period, specifically, as I'm saying, the steelworks. And sometimes the discussions were more complicated uh, at home because we were not ready uh, to have uh, fair competition. Uh, some politicians were not ready for that. It's not about the left wing or right wing uh, government because I started during the government of uh, Václav Klaus, then uh, uh, Mr. Toshovsky, the caretakers government, and then we continued uh, with Miloš Zeman, where the where not to uh, to invest 300 million in the company so that it doesn't go bankrupt. There was a big will to make the company uh, keep the companies alive. But fortunately, we got to a situation where we started uh, fil uh, fulfilling certain commitments because it made us save a lot in terms of um, the the taxes and the state budget. Okay, so we've managed, uh, despite some transitory periods, th that's where we are, and we've been there for 20 years. Would you like to add something to the, the answers to your colleagues? Uh, I'm, I'm really, I like talking, I apologize. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it's been heard here very nicely that uh, single market is something that uh, the consumers should, uh, should benefit most of it. Uh, who works more should have more. And uh, we should realize that this is true and uh, who works more should have more. And uh, uh, we sometimes are unable to negotiate this and that's why we blame uh, evil Brussels and if we negotiate more we have more if we spoke about speak about food stuffs uh, how come that uh, polls uh, bring uh, bring us uh, more um, food but they negotiated uh, better conditions or uh, that they wanted to ban uh, the uh, the kind of ram uh, the called uh, Tuzemak, uh, it is not uh, made uh, in a um, in a certain way and uh, that's why there was a ban uh, on this. Uh, but Europe gave us a chance to negotiate the exceptions. And we had 10 years for it. And two years before the end of this exception, we uh, we just realized that uh, we were supposed to negotiate something. I think this is a bit more complex. Uh, uh, one thing is what makes sense to negotiate. If I take this uh, kind of ram, uh, uh, so I don't care whether it is called Ram or Tuzemak, which is the local name. But to negotiate something that somebody can make a bubble of it uh, and say, oh, Brussels banned Ram in our country. Uh, but it is not Ram because it is not uh, made uh, according to the recipe of a Ram, which means that the consumer is uh, misled. Uh, and uh, 
uh, we could just call it differently. And for this transitional period, uh, and uh, uh, it, this is not, uh, it, this does not make sense to negotiate. But you have to go against the lobby or against some members of the government and say, why should we uh, try something and negotiate uh, negotiate something that doesn't uh, bring any effect, uh, rather than focusing on something which will have good effect and impact. There are some special studies, usually foreign ones, which evaluate it. And I'm not going to um, praise uh, the negotiation team, but they are available and it is very interesting. Uh, but these negotiations also including one thing. Something is uh, what happens at the negotiation halls but and different things at the press conferences. Of course, this is uh, quite often in the politics. Uh, and uh, if I should uh, nego uh, should um, assess and uh, talk about uh, the negotiation of uh, of um, uh, of uh, w one thing uh, which happened, so the negotiation uh, was not uh, as strong as the as the expression at the press conference. We uh, quoted Adam Smith several times here, and I think he would not agree. If we talk about competition here today. So competition is not about exceptions and evil Brussels uh should not be in the institution where we negotiate something in order for us to get something better from the market. Brussels should be an institution which makes uh, conditions balanced uh, throughout the markets, throughout the single market and uh, for us. And it is up to us to be able to communicate it. You are saying that it doesn't make sense to bother about this to the mark RAM and uh, whether we have uh, do nuts packed in a plastic bag or not. This is the problem because we simplify everything and uh, uh, but I understand uh, what uh, he doesn't agree with me. <laughs> So, because if it was up to me, uh, so and if I, I just don't discuss and negotiate about competition at all. On the other hand, about the steel industry, it was really significant because, uh, yes, I understand. I don't want to end uh, this debate in a in a blind end. Uh, I think it is important to keep explaining. And this is uh, why we have this debate. We wanted this to bring to the people, to people, and uh, this is what we will succeed in. I would like to ask if uh, our, uh, if the the audience have some uh, questions. Would you like to ask about something? Maybe we could um, kind of break our monopoly. So please uh, uh, say your name and your question. I'm sorry, uh, the translators cannot hear the question uh, because the speaker is not speaking uh, into the microphone. From 1989 until today, we were, have been accompanied by corruption. This octopus. Uh, has been uh, ad adhered to all fields of our economy. I will uh, give you three characteristics which define the corruption from my point of view. Number one, it is uh, that the state uh, 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 supports corruption. Um, number two is that uh, uh, the not many authorities uh, understand corruption, and this uh, is, I include the Office for the Protection of Competition. And number three is, uh, uh, I am probably not the only one who would like to uh, beat corruption. I'm sorry, there is not uh, somebody here brave from the press that we could uh, talk about this uh, top, this problem. 
more. But I will give you two specific examples how the state takes care or, takes care or not about the corruption. On the 28th of uh, March uh, of last year, I wrote to the government of the Czech Republic that there was a real there was a real uh, danger about uh, the uh, the uh, new uh, unit built in Dukovany, and I proposed uh, uh, how to deal with it. Uh, uh, I I used to. Uh, I, uh, I used to trade in uh, public uh, public uh, projects, uh, and uh, as I uh, follow it and uh, see it on television, we can I can see that corruption keeps uh, on going. And uh, when I am here at this uh, meeting, I'd like to say something about legislation. We know all that, uh, for example, in the United States, the tax uh, tax fraud is um, uh, taken as the second uh, second uh, hardest uh, crime, uh, and uh, this is different uh, from our country. I'd like to uh, show give. Uh, give my example. I understand uh, the judgments uh, of all our courts. I was, uh, co I was uh, convicted, uh, uh, but I, uh, I did not uh, uh, commit uh, any tax. Uh, tax uh, I'm sorry, can I interrupt this? Can we uh, stick to our topic of competition? I understand your first uh, comment. Uh, but can we please uh, go back to our topic of competition? If I may, as you mentioned uh, corruption, this is exactly what uh, competition can uh, limit. And uh, uh, for example, now, uh, for example, the competition for uh, the building of uh, uh, met metro uh, of uh, in Prague, uh, uh, it uh, this is uh, now a current topic. Uh, I'd like to add some things. Please, uh, can you can you uh, speak uh, on the topic? I'd like to say that uh, within my anti-corruption anti-corruption uh, mission, I wanted to I wanted to visit uh, the office for the protection of uh, competition. Uh, I wanted to visit Mr. Mersna, uh, the president uh, of the office. Uh, the secretary came here, and uh, when I said that I was a private person, she just uh, asked me to go away. So. President, if I should uh, react to something what is important for public debate, uh, our uh, criminal policy and uh, the approach to the breaking of the rules uh, of uh, competition, we have uh, uh, we have um, a section 248A uh, of the Criminal Act. Uh, uh, what is cartel? For example, in the crime, crime criminal policy of uh, the United States, uh, states it is uh, a crime. It is a uh, there is a insider training, murder, cartel, and we in the European continental uh, environment we are quite lenient to the as for the cartel and small uh, just uh, small breakages of the rules. Uh, um, in terms, uh, we have quite a, a, a lenient approach to them. And uh, I personally think, and uh, we have this debate, uh, uh, it has been shown very nicely uh, on, uh, the f on the last uh, amendment uh, of the law of the protection of the competition, which became effective in July of this year, when the uh, our office, uh, competition office, uh, had uh, acquired the opportunity to Get uh, the uh, get uh, the uh, the eavesdrop uh, the wiretap wiretapping tapped uh, recordings uh, and uh, use them in the in the administrative procedure. 
let's say, a cartel, but another authority cannot use it. So you would be surprised what kind of debate uh, we had in the House of Parliament to avoid uh, uh, enforcement uh, of this investigation body and who knows how it's going to be used and number of things why something is not possible. Uh, just like the debate on whether the office in case of carter agreements, vertical agreements uh, could uh, uh, ban uh, doing business for the statutory bodies of the corporation to uh, ban the CEO of a corporation to exercise the office for five years. And you see a kind of apathy, although you say that this is something that works abroad. Uh, it's applied in several member states of the EU, maybe half of them. But here the debate is uh, very cautious. Uh, so the control bodies should give, uh, should give, uh, get such a competence, but such competence that they do not really stick out um, without uh, uh, being quite powerful and uh, strict. So I think that this is a paradigm that we have in the Czech society, also in other discussions. In many many times we want cases, we want things that are contradictory, but we want them at the same time, and we want them at the cost of uh, zero sacrifices or zero costs. And I think that uh, this is the uh, status that we are at now, uh, like the rum. Let's save our rum, but we don't deal with other things because, on the one hand, we want to have low prices of everything, but on the other hand, we want to have a zero deficit in the state budget. On the one hand, everyone wants uh, uh, support to uh, be good in the market. If they don't get the support, if they don't get the, the aid, uh, they uh, threaten to go bankrupt, which never happens. So the competition is also policy. It's also policy that uh, is reflected in a number of areas of the state uh, work. And what is the most important thing is discussion. And this is the last uh, comment on my my side, very often we try to say that uh, we have a free market and this is uh, when I want to hint at Brussels. Maybe that's when uh, Adenhauer in the 19, 1957, they signed the agreements and they said, OK, let's go for competition free market because this is one of the oldest ag agendas uh, um, uh, that was on the table. This is a key moment. And when you look at how uh, competition has developed at the exemptions uh, have developed, now we are not talking about the competition as a whole. If you look at the block exemptions, what is outside the rules uh, when you can provide uh, subsidies uh, f from out of nowhere and this distorts the competition and I'm saying yet this is distorting and uh, destroying the competition and Green Deal I don't want to touch upon Green Deal but the public uh, good of green policy and sustainability has been moved forward you say okay this is what we want and although it uh, distorts the competition it's good because it meets the uh, the political objective so of course this is okay this is a legitimate discussion decisions but you need to say that then the competition that takes place without any regulation uh, exemptions, this is something that has been uh, narrowed down. So some of the markets basically do not work at all uh, based on the competition principles because this was the political decision and the rules uh, would uh, not apply. Thank you. And uh, now, given the timing, I'm getting to the second round of other questions. And then we'll have uh, questions coming from the audience and from Slido. So uh, I would like to ask uh, you, uh, Professor, to get back to a different topic, because for a long time you have focused on competition policy in rail transport. And rail transport is a very specific sector that is gradually being uh, liberalized in the EU member states. 
So uh, how do you think this market works uh, in terms of rail um, transport? Can we talk about fair competition in terms of rail transport? Well, this is a very interesting question within the context of our debate. It very well uh, shows the role of the European Union in liberalizing of a certain uh, field uh, in the field of transport and rail transport in this specific case. So if I look at it from the end, from what is uh, the most comprehensible, the most visible, and then, of course, I will get to the more complicated things. Um, so what is the most visible thing is, uh, let's say, the importance of uh, open competition in a transport, rail transport, a certain route. In the Czech context, we know it very well, a line from Prague to Ostrava, which was the first uh, uh, railway line, not only in the Czech Republic, but the first one, uh, one of the first one in Europe that was uh, fully liberalized, where the rail uh, transport started competing, really competing uh, itself, not two of them, but three of them. And uh, well, uh, this uh, line stopped being subsidized by the government, so the market really showed up in this specific segment, but still the effect was immediate, it was tangible, and uh, it was uh, quite clear. A major drop in the fare, uh, in the ticket prices, which is a great benefit, a clear benefit for the consumers, a great increase in the quality compared to the original provider, Czech Railways, because, of course, they operated uh, Bendolino trains as a premium uh, brand. Uh, but, of course, the standard uh, express trains, as we remember over the past 50 years, uh, nothing has changed there. So the, the, the shift was great. Then you can see similar effects all around Europe. You can see high-speed uh, railway lines in Italy with two uh, competing transporters, and the ticket prices are um, much lower than the prices in high-speed trains uh, in other countries in Europe where there is no competition. We have a case, we have an example from Spain where the uh, national transporter, a railway transporter could provide the operation uh, like once in an hour at a uh, high price of the ticket. It wasn't really in high demand. It wasn't a popular transport service. Once a competitor joined the market, the service is elsewhere. Suddenly you have uh, rails uh, coming every 15 minutes. The fare prices have dropped uh, huge interest on the part of the consumers. And this is the principle that also makes it possible to what the chairman was referring to a while ago because the European Union, the individual governments, they do not only follow a certain target, they have, uh, they pursue targets within a certain complex. One of them, of course, uh, climate protection uh, uh, commitments under the Green Deal. We need to get the passengers for the trains and we only get them if the passengers uh, get such an offer that they really demand something that is efficient for them. And as I said, uh, something that is worth uh, spending their funds on, they aren't earned money. So this is the market principle. So until then, it works perfectly. The second thing that is not that visible is that the competition is great, but but once you have some specifics of the markets coming in, it starts hindering. One of the specific features of railway transport is a huge investments you need. If you want to have new uh, train and start a new route, it's extremely expensive. If you look at it uh, um, from the point of view of the Czech Republic, from Prague to Ostrava, the transporters came to the conclusion that uh, Okay, the service go works well. The service is uh, uh, quite favorable in terms of pricing. The fare is low. And thanks to the in, uh, intensive competition, the fare is so low that it doesn't generate enough funds for the transporters to uh, renovate the, the fleet. So if you look at the trains of the Regio jets, uh, so these are discarded uh, coaches from uh, uh, Austrian railways that have been refurbished. They meet the purpose, pur purpose but that's not what you really expect uh, from a quality transport service. So the reason I'm saying it is that the um, industry has some specific features and uh, it's up to the regulator who can set up the parameters of the market so that you can help the market. So the Prague-Ostrava market was open from one day to another. 
So over the past 100 years, there was no competition there. And suddenly, from one day to another, the market completely opened up. And what is discussed in other countries uh, also now is how to set up the parameters of the market to make sure that you don't have too strong competition, uh, which uh, results in the fact that the market gets blocked at a certain status where none of the uh, competitors can generate enough uh, revenues to invest in the development of the market. So why did the price go so low? If you say that uh, the fare is so low, well, this is the, com the, princ this is the principle of competition. I cannot uh, speculate whether some uh, transporters uh, used some predator uh, 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 prices. Uh, this is the case which has been uh, closed, so I won't, uh, I won't talk about it. But there was one line. They were through uh, transporting companies, and they had an opportunity to either compete by price or by the quality. They try to compete also by the uh, quality, for example, orchids at some toilets uh, in the or coffee uh, for free. This is also the quality, but we also uh, consider as quality uh, if uh, uh, to have uh, good air conditioning, uh, new carriages, uh, uh, functional uh, toilets, etc. But this no longer happens because the competition uh, pushed uh, the prices so low that the market is not able to react in such a way that they could uh, they could uh, uh, they could uh, renew the fleet, for example. Example. So the invisible market uh, hand uh, operated in such a way and uh, but is this going to lead to the fact uh, that uh, uh, that uh, the customer should decide? Uh, so I, uh, for example, tra traveled yesterday. Uh, yesterday. Uh, by train from um, from Prague, uh, I wasn't given the coffee. I I and but will I take it next time? This is my choice. The the. Uh, the the question is how far I have to accept uh, the conditions. Uh, so. Out of 50%, they will give me the money back. For example, this is like Ryanair in the air industry. It has worked uh, in such a way um, for a long time, and it's been successful. Uh, I fully agree with the role of the regulator, but uh, if we look at the rail transport, we need to look at it in the context of entire uh, transport. And if we look at the Prague, Brno, uh, traveling and if you use uh, electric uh, car, so what are your uh, incentives to take the car to take the train and how the how the road transport is disadvantaged so uh, the consumers should get the quality uh, from the service uh, and uh, what the president said here in terms of green deal how uh, we should uh, uh, support uh, uh, which uh, type of transport by regulation. In terms of the fleet, uh, this is also the question of the business model. I am one of the European coordinators for Trans-European net Network, uh, for example, from Tallinn to Warsaw. I was coordinating uh, the uh, the member states and the rail companies to agree on things and the business model which I can see here is the lease of the uh, fleet and this can be set up by some incentive if the lease uh, leasing can operate in other areas it can also operate in the rail transport it is of course more complicated more complex and i agree that here the regulator does not uh, uh, does not give uh, a 100% work uh, this is uh, one more topic uh, which we have already touched 
and this is sustainability. I would like to ask, uh, does sustainability or should sustainability play a role in a competition, uh, in competition protection? Uh, this is the question to the president of the of the office. As uh, the society is uh, evolving, how the depth of the European uh, European integration is uh, developed, uh, so <coughs> the. Uh, the uh, the integration also develops. Uh, so uh, af after the war, uh, the the integration was uh, focusing on not allowing the war again. And uh, uh, the also uh, there was, for example, an effort to get out of uh, the sphere of bipolar world after the revolution. And uh, now the social exchange of the goals is uh, coming and uh, we um, it has changed uh, uh, what the competition should be about and what it, what it should serve for. When we look at the European um, leadership of Ursula von der Leyen, so they, uh, they are focusing on massive uh, fight against climate changes. Um, it has focused on uh, Green Deal and uh, in my opinion, uh, right from the beginning, it was a political goal. But what I missed there in was a full implementation plan for entire Europe and uh, individual member states. The example with uh, steel industry was very nice. If we did not support uh, the steel um, steelworks uh, in the north of Moravia, at the time of accession, they would have gone bankrupt. And uh, this is what was good. Uh, and we supported them. Uh, we uh, basically set up the goal, and now we are trying to find uh, the 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 ways why uh, how to achieve it uh, uh, everybody has different structural uh, issues the Czech Republic cannot be compared with uh, France uh, and uh, or um, different countries, uh, we have differently functioning industry or uh, agriculture. Uh, the transfer transition to the uh, organic farming is uh, is very complicated. Uh, we need uh, the chemical industry producing fertilizers to also adjust itself to uh, green parameters. We all think that it is about the electric use of electric cars, but uh, this is only an error view. We have to look at how the construction industry will change, how architecture will change, how the me mechanical industry engineering will change. We are definitely able to uh, to achieve uh, the reduction of carbon dioxide in the air. Uh, this is uh, beyond any doubt. Uh, if uh, uh, the use of uh, electric cars will spread more in Europe, it will be great. There will be not so many so many uh, combustion products. But if you compare it uh, with uh, one ship, uh, so which uh, which uh, tra which uh, which carries uh, carries some stuff uh, from China to other countries, so it produces much more. Uh, it's it produces much more uh, combustion uh, products as cars in Prague for one year. So there should be a global agreement. Uh, uh, there were some uh, some meetings, like in Dubai recently, and there is a gr great reversibility of um, uh, of the United States, uh, of China, of the of India. And if you don't uh, convince these states, so you can talk about our our fight uh, for climate uh, against climate changes but it will be a, a really drop in the asian at the uh, ocean at the cost of the transformation of entire not only czech but entire european uh, society 
If we look at what where we are going, so we have to have a look uh, in what uh, time uh, time horizon it is uh, realistic, and this is a political question. And if the politicians say, "Oh, let us go in the same pace, and we will change the legislation," so also other policies like competition policy has to resp uh, respect it. We know now that uh, the competitors are smart. Uh, if they see that there is a political narrative which is popular, such as Green Deal, so they are able to adjust uh, itself and uh, they they create like uh, greenwashing. Uh, and this is, uh, for example, uh, the if we look at the Dutch uh, chicken and animal welfare, uh, uh, the Dutch uh, producers. Uh, breeders of animals raised uh, the price of uh, of chicken meat uh, by 60% of poultry because they implemented animal welfare uh, measures for for cage uh, cage bred uh, chickens and uh, then they uh, found out uh, that uh, the area uh, for one uh, chicken was was increased by one one uh, square centimeter the narrative was animal welfare and the increased uh, price in the market was 60% and this is greenwashing so you as a competitor can find a way how to abuse the the way which is well well intended so this is what what we have to deal with as well as competition authorities thank you we have got uh, a little bit to the competitors at the world on the worldwide scale and now i would like to ask mr telichka this is a great challenge already, but I wanted to ask you, what do you see as other challenges in competition policy in the current context? For example, if we take the context of the coronavirus crisis, the war in Ukraine and the subsequent energy crisis, climate change and the transition to clean energy. Well, again, I have to go back to history. I don't want to keep talking about the accession negotiations, but uh, still, at that time, uh, we it was shortly after uh, the um, uniform economic market creation, and this is a great progress. And the political mood at that time was uh, very well set. So that the intervention would be as low as possible, and no one wanted the internal market to collapse within a few years. So everyone realized, and it could be quantified. Everyone realized what it, this is going to bring the union, uh, the member states, and the corporations. At that time, the policy of the member states was uh, quite open and solidary. If you look at it from a distance now, you see that uh, uh, now it's becoming more and more egoistic at the level of the member states. And uh, what has changed is also the politician to a, a great extent. The key entity uh, developing and creating the ecosystem, the politician has changed because now we think more about what should uh, what it should bring inside the state. In other uh, words, we don't have so many politicians, and I will name two that are quite different: uh, the German Christian Democrat Mr. Kohl and the French Socialist Mitterrand. So uh, they cannot be more different than that. But these were politicians, and of course others uh, who have who had a vision. They could uh, think think things. Uh, things through, they could map out the impacts and have the will and the political courage to go against the people meters. And this has changed a lot. And uh, uh, I'm saying it intentionally because you are talking about COVID, the energy crisis and other things. And what I'm afraid of uh, is that the immunity against uh, interfering in the fair competition has dropped. Sometimes it's legitimate, of course, if it's a temporary restriction and results in restructuralization or if you have an emergency. 
but I'm scared of a situation when and it's not something that you will find shocking. Uh, you have uh, a country saying that let's uh, support our industry with 1 billion euros. I'm not, I don't know how much the Czech Republic, um, if we don't look at the Czech Republic, but let's say I don't know how much Bulgaria can support its economy. It wouldn't be 100 billion, but let's say 20 billion euros. And suddenly you can see that the approach is changing. You see that the domestic market comes first. And this is a great role and great responsibility for the European Commission as the uh, economic body for the entire EU. And I think they are generally doing well. And I know it from my former colleagues. Uh, quite often, the Commission is under pressure. And it's also a great responsibility of the national offices for the protection of competition. So this period this is quite specific uh, from one crisis to another being economic or political crisis, it doesn't really matter, but the immunity is being reduced and it's very easy to say, okay, let's support it, let's invest in it. And sometimes you have all kinds of pretexts, so it can be economic crisis and so on. So I believe that here we can see two basic tasks. One of them is uh, to boost the immunity again. And it won't be easy at all, because if uh, at the introduction we said that it's very difficult, uh, you, you, you said that uh, if you knew that you would start your business on that, how to explain uh, some facts. So this is very difficult. But the second role is uh, the economy industries are developing. And now we have very different technologies that we than we used to have. I believe that sometimes we tend to, well, we have to uh, pause. We should start the regulation at a late stage because it's quite logical because the business and the technologies will always be ahead. And if you start later, then you should screw it up even more and reflect the policy, which is quite legitimate, but it's not always the good tool, saying that we need to be independent of uh, China, USA, and so on. But what is the problem? Do we do it right? So now it's about the competition. Uh, it's also about the consumers. We also need to talk about the businesses, uh, companies that want to, we want them to be innovative in terms of green deal, digitalization, all kinds of disciplines. But we have these companies, but not necessarily the ecosystem is created in the right way. And still you have airliners, you have national companies, uh, and still sometimes uh, you have to make some investments if you make some changes at the airport and you get, give a green light to the purchase of new uh, planes. It's quite uh, difficult to find the right balance. And I have another concern, and, uh, and this will be the end of my remark, uh, how to evaluate the impacts, but really uh, objective evaluation of uh, the facts through a review and uh, by returning some proposals, not in terms of the consumer pro uh, protection, competition protection, but also cyber security. So if uh, we don't have uh, time for that, but I'm quite in favor of uh, the new EU legislation in terms of uh, digital markets. Uh, but Digital Markets Act, who has evaluated the impacts in terms of cyber security? No one did. No one did. So uh, we should really find the leadership that will say, OK, this is enough. OK, some, sometimes we lag behind. We have new politicians. But what is it we want to evaluate? And then uh, we should follow the results of the evaluation. And I believe that we will be able to come back from the crossroads uh, and follow the right path. But it's not going to be simple. And if I listen, well, if I listen to uh, some of the Czech politicians, I'm afraid that uh, um, we will have to hit the walls a few times before we manage to find the right direction out of the crossroads. I don't think I've answered your question, but yes, but you have brought up uh, several um, important topics. So we have touched upon the state aid, uh, our rules, uh, emergency rules, general rules uh, for 
uh, the uh, provision of um, state aid, we of course touched upon the competition on a global scale. Now uh, the digital markets. So before uh, we get to the questions from the audience, I would like to give the floor to you because uh, we've heard uh, several important, uh, we've heard about several important topics. Uh, Mrs. Helgertova wants to respond, so the floor is yours. I don't know if you know, Pavel Telička has spoken about somebody, so it is Germany, which is the strongest economy, who said, oh, our price does not uh, manage uh, the, uh, the, uh, the high prices of energy, and that's why we will, and we need to compete to the world, so we will, we will uh, support them by 200 billion, we will uh, support uh, our companies in order for them to survive. But, but suddenly, other companies like <coughs> In the Czech Republic, which is uh, which is very dependent on t- on the on Germany, and who needs to be able to uh, supply Germany um, for competitive prices, so they say we don't get the subsidies. How how can we survive? We will go bankrupt. So this is the discussion which uh, has been mentioned. But during the COVID time, when uh, the uh, when the rules for state aid were released uh, in order for the companies to survive uh, uh, this uh, situation, all the countries wanted to help. But uh, and, um, uh, 80% of all the aid provided uh, within COVID in the European Union was in France and in Germany. So So uh, in the remaining uh, 25 uh, countries, uh, there was only 20% of the aid left for them. Uh, So these are uh, really different conditions. And there are some proposals about the the single fund. uh, And this is a discussion which uh, the Czech Republic was kind of uh, um, uh, stood uh, aside. Uh, And uh, if we look at uh, the history where where the European Commission was able to intervene, so as in terms of the advantage of single market. So if we look at the air ticket, so uh, the European Union is taken as the open open sky. For example, an Irish company may not uh, fly only from Ireland. Uh, they can also fly, in, fr- fly from Prague to Italy. This really increased uh, competition and uh, decreased uh, the prices of tickets, uh, of air tickets. And uh, air uh, air industry is uh, the great uh, pollutant uh, of uh, of um, one of the greatest pollutant of carbon uh, dioxide uh, and. Uh, the open sky was uh, was uh, um, was uh, working within the eu there were other countries there was uh, sweden denmark uh, uh, belgium luxembourg plus uh, great britain they had their own bilateral uh, agreements with the us about uh, being able uh, for their companies uh, to fly uh, in uh, uh, with uh, some advantages uh, and europe then said no this is not good for entire europe not everybody is benefiting uh, benefiting from it uh, in the same way and they agreed uh about something else, and it brought uh, benefits uh, to everybody. But we will always come across a different economic situation of strong Germany versus Italy, for example. Italy, um, uh, we don't have to consider Balkan countries. Uh, But uh, now, if we look at it in terms of energy, there will be a major discussion about setting up uh, the single European market in order for it to be fair for everybody. And uh, uh, Europe is uh, the exporter of energy. I'm not... uh, uh, I'm not very uh, very jealous of uh, the work of the regulatory offices, uh, also the energy regulatory office. Um, uh, the state aid <coughs> topic has been uh, has been touched uh, on uh, at the moment when the uh, Ukrainian crisis uh, started. The Commission said, "Let's create uh, the uh, temporary crisis uh, framework. Let us uh, cover uh, I- cover by this." Uh, all state aid. Uh, it was supposed to end. Now it has been uh, straight. It has been. <coughs> 
extended <coughs> to the <coughs> to the middle of 2024, and it's been all again uh, under after the pressure of uh, big uh, states. But how will you explain to the Czech, uh, Czech, uh, Czech companies uh, that the Germans will use this temporary uh, framework and uh, uh, we can't do it. And then we can't uh, say that the competition is not working, that uh, that uh, energy regulation office doesn't work and uh, and uh, these uh, other regulators do not work well. But the, the fact is that this has to be defined by the politicians. <coughs> If the politicians say that, so the regulators will follow their uh, their uh, rules. And But this is not what uh, can be solved by the hands of the market. We can talk about the energy, about gas, about uh, uh, food. For example, the price of food uh, in the Czech Republic has the highest VAT in Europe uh, and uh, one of the highest inflation in Europe. And uh, do we expect that our food will be the cheapest? Eurostat uh, compared that we have about the six cheapest uh, food. Uh, uh, this is the statistics. We have the six cheapest uh, cheapest uh, food, uh, uh, while we have we are having the highest VAT and uh, one of the highest inflation rates. Uh, I consider this as a small miracle if we consider this situation. If we compare ourselves uh, ourselves uh, with Poland, which has a selective advantage of zero percent VAT, uh, and uh, if we cons uh, if we cancel VAT, the food in the Czech Republic will be also cheaper. If you don't uh, ask for 15 crowns or of from each uh, 100 crowns. But we want everything. We want zero uh, deficit of uh, state budgets. We want competitive uh, industry. We want cheap uh, food. We don't have any priorities or uh, the courage to say, oh, this is our policy and politics. Uh, we, you will have high, high uh, taxes. If you don't like it, you have to uh, elect uh, a different government next time. And this uh, shows an unfair dialogue uh, also in the professional public. Uh, if we say we have uh, high VAT, we have uh, high inflation, inflation, but this is de definitely a cartel agreement. Uh, why? Why the food uh, is uh, so uh, so expensive? Uh, so, but this applies to the to entire European Union. Uh, it is not a, about the cartels. It is about the sensitive markets. Uh, even the national states don't have uh, an influence on what the price of uh, the commodities will be. Even in uh, the agriculture, sugar is traded at uh, the uh, sugar uh, stock uh, in London. So we have to admit that in the global market, in the global world, uh, the political tools are very limited about how to uh, how to interf intervene with the market which uh, is not regulated, uh, and this is fair to admit. Of course, the prices of foods, uh, this is really something that uh, many of our viewers uh, are concerned about. I have a question to you, Mrs. Helgertova, but if you don't mind, I will please uh, first ask whether we have some um, questions from the audience. And if not, we'll come back to the last question. Of course, I'll be more than happy to answer. So. Uh, uh, Josef Pechek, I come from the Faculty of Law for a long time. I am uh, quite concerned and irritated uh, by the uh, politics behind the competition law. One of them has been mentioned by the chairman. How do the politicians prote protect themselves against uh, some tools that could uh, uh, enforce the competition rules? Uh, the second thing is that was a big uh, danger, unfortunately did not materialize. But a few years ago, the competition did not approve a large merge between a German and French uh, manufacturer of railway uh, coaches, Astrom and Siemens. Uh, 
Of course they can do it, but uh, then the political pressure exercised by the French and German governments, uh, not only to revert the decision, fortunately it didn't happen, but to change the rules, to change the rules for the uh, oversight of the competition so that the decision of the independent body, the commission, according to some principles and tests, would be reviewed by uh, politicians, by uh, the Council of Europe, the supreme political body, meaning that the competition would uh, be disemboweled. On the other hand, if it comes in handy, then of course the competition uh, body is a good thing, like in case of the foodstuff. Suddenly it's good to have the office and we can come with pseudo agreements. So when should it be a political decision, uh, as the chairman says, how to change the foodstuff prices? The politicians do not have enough courage, but then they can blame the office uh, for the protection of uh, competition. Sorry. And then another con concern I have. Um, it's also about the sustainability and the green uh, deal. In many cases, it uh, uh, the competition office should be like the Committee for General Welfare that should be responsible for all the sins and it should de deal with gender equality, it should deal with the protection of privacy, it should deal with uh, carbon footprint, sustainability and so on. But all this at the cost of uh, endangering uh, the essence itself of what the competition should be about. Competition should be a self-regulatory independent mechanisms. And if the politicians can change it according to their current needs, then uh, we can just uh, forget about competition. Unfortunately, this is already happening, but we keep learning. Uh, we keep observing uh, how the self-regulatory mechanism is being limited. Uh, we get a lot of exemptions and political interventions, and I find this a huge risk, a strategic risk. And of course, uh, the other details, this is more uh, secondary. Thank you, Mr. Talichka. Uh, well, thank you. Well. I'm a great uh, proponent of competition. I, when I was in the commission, uh, the, uh, Fritz Bugenstein, my Dutch colleague, was complaining at the Prague Castle that I uh, was uh, dealing with his ready uh, directive. Uh, yes. Uh, and of course, whatever I said is true, but I still have one uh, correction or maybe response uh, to what uh, you've said. The truth is that we need to react to what is happening in the society, what happens in terms of climate and other areas. But I see one important moment. Just like with the state aid, with steelworks, I can imagine a restricted time, restricted uh, in terms of intensity, some uh, restricted uh, incentive support, and at the same time, leading to some results. So uh, as regards the steelworks, the textile industry, uh, this should be uh, aimed at restruct restructuralization to make the business competitive. If not, if they cannot do it within the time uh, limit, uh, it would go bankrupt. And we ha need to have the will to accept it. The problem I see, and I think that unfortunately the Czech Republic is excelling uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, climate, because of course, we have all kinds of uh, pretexts, but we cannot do without that because these are huge investments. But it must result; uh, it must lead to the result, and I see several results. And besides, this uh, this is also a result in the specific industrial sector, meaning that the industry, the Czech entity or the European entity, German, French entity, is able to offer uh, a product uh, that meets the green criteria. Of course, it should be a conceptual solution, you should have a plan, you should have evaluation of the impacts, but this must be in place. But still, I need to say this. I see one problem here, because we understand this as um, a cane. But in fact, it's an opportunity. So this is not a stick. This is an opportunity. So besides, uh, except for some other sectors like the digital companies, uh, to a certain extent, we are like an assembly line. And we are the last uh, break. But we would really like to make the maximum use of this. We should 
be in the areas that are only starting up, highly innovative areas, and we should be the global leader. We have these companies. We can do it. So the time restriction and the conditionality are crucial. And I'm saying it as uh, someone who does not really like it, uh, someone who really uh, likes to have uh, the maximum possible liberal environment. Well, back to your question concerning the poli politics behind the competition. How do you see it? Well, I agree to my colleague and with Adam Smith as well. We have heard about him today. Of course, the main distort of competition has always been the government, the state. And that's why we need to make sure that we have these independent institutions that bring back the spirit of uh, free market and that they enforce uh, such a status that none of the real and potential competitors can get the lobbying and that can tame the regulator, tame the government and enforce his own interest uh, uh, with the former support of the government. This is the risk I understand and of course this is something we, we need to defend ourselves against. That's why we need these independent institutions uh, that uh, stand behind the institution. So now we have a question from Slido. Maybe it comes to you. Uh, most likely, there will be another wave of mergers in agriculture and food industry. Many of these are likely to be below the limit, under the threshold. Does uh, the office intend to use the procedure as a tower, like in the case of tower cast? Well, uh, this is quite likely. As regards our analysis, uh, nothing really indicates that there should be some wave of mergers in this industry because this sector is. Uh, uh, stable for a long time and uh, if you look at the input costs of the uh, sector of agriculture and food processing of course each of the the entities uh, keep their stable uh, power if we have some big uh, businesses that uh, uh, want to be like predators and they want to swallow up the smaller producers or the primary producers we don't know yet whether it's uh, the um, traditional below the threshold uh, mergers uh, as defined by the competition law without any um, oversight by uh, the Office for the Protection of Competition as ex ante examination, I don't know. But <coughs> of course, the, the power. Uh, where we can also go somewhere where we feel the potential danger. Of course, it could be these killer acquisitions, but I'm not in favor of this because the European Commission now uh, started uh, looking at cases, even if they don't meet the turnover criteria to permit the measures, the European Commission refuses to allow for some measures because uh, the Commission thinks that the killer acquisition will limit the market, like the uh, auto talk. This is a system developing with the motorways and all the information systems and uh, brings it to the car. So we have a progressive startup company in this area. And this company is a great competition uh, for the global companies. Uh, this global company controlling this market. And the, re the danger is that these uh, huge uh, automotive uh, corporations will start buying the startup product. So then this big company came in and said, OK, your company is worth 50 million euros, I will give you 500 million euros. So do you take it, guys? So why not? Uh, this is good. Uh, so let's move on. And the Commission says no, because it will kill the market. This uh, large uh, uh, corporation will kill the market. And as a result, they will retain their monopolistic or dominant position in the market. And this is where we enter. But as the office, uh, when we start using these rules and we say, OK, it uh, doesn't mean the threshold limits, but still there could be uh, increased concentration in the market, then we behave the competitors as, uh, as a suspect. Uh, because we say, well, it seems to us that you could uh, 
you could uh, go for some uh, anti-competitive practice, so we will forbid you for, from doing it from day one. So what I'm saying uh, is that all the activities uh, re related to the mergers, this is very much about the private property, so we have to really be very careful. If you tell someone you cannot handle your private assets this way, because we believe that we need to protect the competition and you could potentially do something wrong, and there is this risk and we will forbid you from doing it. And I believe that we really have to be very careful about it. So your answer is rather not. And now you have uh, room for your questions. Uh, if you can say your name and your uh, uh, question. Um, I'm from uh, the Faculty of Law of Masarinkyu University. My question is to uh, the president of the office. I will follow up uh, what you said uh, some uh, time ago. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better to talk about it uh, in the style of the obligations uh, um, rather than uh, permitting it uh, in a liberal way? And uh, my question is about the legal entities uh, and uh, responsibility for uh, the uh, concluding cartel agreements. And my question is why and if uh, the office uh, pushes uh, the legislators to change this, that is, uh, if uh, there would be a prosecution per permitted of uh, legal entities or if uh, the punishments uh, of uh, the, the office uh, to be able to impose on uh, legal entities uh, increase. So number one is uh, about the obligations. Uh, it is case by case. Uh, sometimes uh, it is good for you to have a structure, uh, structure uh, uh, commitment, uh, so that the competitor sells part of the uh, the company, or um, some behavior um, uh, commitments are better. But it is a question, uh, and I admit that the office is quite conservative. And uh, if there were some obligations in the past, they were structured, like they had to be selling, and uh, you don't have a guarantee that somebody who is going to buy it uh, um, will sustain this, um, will uh, and this is, for example, about Penam a company, uh, which was bought by the company. Um, it was uh, Penam and United Bakeries, but uh, they uh, they uh, they went bankrupt. Uh, so there is no guarantee that uh, the competitor will be uh, created in the market, which will be uh, competitive about uh, the punishing of uh, the uh, legal entities. So legal entities can be uh, prosecuted, uh, but uh, not for the cartel, but uh, for crime similar to cartels. Uh, and for example, some corruption, uh, corruption crime. Uh, so uh, this usually is similar to bid rigging. Um, if we have the cartel of the bid rigging um, uh, thing, um, and uh, another thing is uh, what uh, is uh, uh, what is um, followed by the prosecutors and uh, the police. Uh, it's like uh, we will give you something a little, uh, but uh, the idea that we will give you more, uh, this is what we politicians don't like very much. Uh, this is um, and this is what uh, we find uh, very uh, brave, very courageous. This is what, for example, our office can impose on uh, on. Uh, responsible representatives, uh, uh, like um, if we apply uh, this uh, for the first time, we applied it in the past, but it was not essential for the market. Uh, and of course, the pressure on the office is increasing, but it is not related to uh, the competition only. Uh, there is uh, 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 if we tread on somebody's uh, um, toes, so uh, it, they will immediately start saying that the office has to be reformed because it is harmful for everything, for the competition, for the projects, for anything. It would be best for us to to do it. Uh, 
in our ways. Uh, so this is a very complicated discussion. The time has uh, unfortunately uh, going to the end. Uh, this is an interesting discussion and we could uh, continue in it. Uh, Mrs. Hergetova, this is the question to you. Uh, do you have any other types? Uh, the question is about the the question, the trust of the Czech Republic in you is low on the website. The disinformation is uh, appears. Uh, how can we? How can media uh, contribute to the following of the communication of EU? It depends what media you are following. Who have learned it from Idnes? So please do look, change your view on information. Uh, the people, uh, people usually, uh, young people today uh, get uh, this information from 15 second info stories. Uh, so please uh, uh, look at uh, the uh, sources of, uh, uh, of uh, the media and uh, uh, then uh, the topic uh, attracts you after 15 seconds, uh, then you may get into more depths. Uh, and um, if uh, you speak about the, the, the hamsters, which was uh, in this uh, uh, the the ban on uh, on breeding ha hamsters, uh, which were apparently was published at the Edness CZ. Uh, so you should uh, choose uh, the the media which you follow so this is the opinion media leadership this is not uh, uh, only the uh, the role of the media, it is the political representation's roles uh, as well. And this, in our opinion, is failing. Uh, so this is the role for all of us. Uh, thank you. It will be interesting to continue, uh, but uh, uh, we can continue uh, during the refreshment uh, which is prepared uh, outside. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you for um, inviting, for, for accepting our invitation. I would like to thank the audience for um, for giving us their time. I'd like to ask the uh, the Pomilioglum agency, the organizational team, and also Eura Derek Center here in Brno. And I'd like to thank the Office for the Protection of Competition and Masaryk University. Thank you very much, and let us continue the informal debate uh, outside where we we have some refreshment prepared. Thank you.